Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale Cadillac Gauge V100 XM706 armor car. Since the last video update, the last of the vehicle's power steering equipment and details have been mounted, completing the suspension of this vehicle. And you can also see how the detailing is beginning to flesh out on the rear plate here. We'll be going over all of this information and these details in this video, so stay tuned. And here are the remainder of the power steering components that I just mentioned. They are all mounted on this runner. And this runner here consists of parts for the clevis, the hydraulic ram, as well as all the linkage and hookup systems that are going to be required in order to get the thing fully outrigged. Along these lines you'll see another little runner over here. These are little fittings and these fittings are going to be used for the hydraulic lines that are going to be found on the ram when that gets assembled. All of these components that you see here along with the insert itself are going to be listed on the eastcoastarmory.com catalog and can be purchased for anyone who's well working on their own V100 and wants to save some time by not fabricating all these little details that we have here. And here we have the power steering system now hooked up. The components that you see here are really more or less a rough prototype. I've already made some changes to the set here to make it a lot more accurate and to give a better representation of what the real units would be. However, for this build over here, I'm going to utilize the following system. Basically the power steering works well, much along similar lines as it does on several other trucks. Here we have a hydraulic ram. The ram is connected to the vehicle via two hydraulic tubes. These are going to be added, but this is going to be mounted after it's painted, and I'll touch upon that in a moment. But here we have the hydraulic ram. It then connects this very large oversized yoke right here. The yoke pivot point is right here, so when the ram articulates and goes up and down, it moves this little cam surface, which in turn pivots this large yoke that's connected to the front differential steering via this linkage that we have here. Sounds complicated, however, it's actually pretty straightforward. Here you can see what the unit looks like from the top, or <laughs> oddly enough this would be the bottom of the vehicle. But if I pivot the steering cluster, you can see exactly how the unit actuates. After seeing the unit in operation, a few of you people are probably scratching your head saying, well, John, that's well and good and all, but this is a military vehicle. Would they really have this type of fragile mechanism here left exposed to the elements or even to enemy fire? I mean, one good shot into here and you're going to lose your steering. And the answer to that is, well, yes, that's what we have right over here. I believe I touched upon this bit of detailing in the last video or two. Basically, this is a shield that protects the hydraulic mechanism right over here from any sort of debris or possibly any sort of small arms fire. The unit when mounted is going to fit on like this and as you can see it actually shields the hydraulic mechanism very well. In order to secure this in place this is facilitated by four fasteners which we have the mounting bosses right here integrally printed onto the main insert that I mentioned in the last video. The fasteners I have them printed on this little runner and from here, the pieces are going to go into paint, and then once painted, I could go through the final installation and installing this cover plate that we have here. I also want to point out that even with the plate installed, it still has plenty of clearance from the wheel, even in its turned and pivoted state. With the power steering mechanism going through its painting process, I can now shift my attention to one of the larger aspects of this video, which is going to be the detailing found on the rear door. The rear door are going to be consisting of the components that you have here on the table. What you see here is the new 1-6 scale V100 rear door hatch set from eastcoastarmory.com. By the time this video gets posted, these pieces here will be added to the catalog. The ones on the table here are basically a pre-production rendition of what the production units are going to be. However, they're very similar with only maybe one or two small little tweaks I need to make to this set here, which are not going to be needed on the actual production units. On top of that, I'm also going to be including several other pieces that are not presently seen on the table, such as some bits of hardware, as well as two small HD 3D printed locks that hold the ballistic glass in place. And on that note, the ballistic glass is also going to be included with the set. 
For anyone who's been following this build on the ECA Facebook page, this should look fairly familiar because I have posted some screen renderings of this set before, but now that the units are in hand, you get a better look at them in better light. This is the bottom portion of the hatch here. Note all of the weld beads are present on this set, as well as the integral handle here. Pretty much all of the external and most of the internal details are all integrally printed. The only components that are not integrally printed are the components that need the function, i.e. the hinge work, the counter spring system, as well as the pistol port, and the little latches that we have on the inside. All these components are found on this runner that we have here that I'll touch upon in a moment. For the top hatch, it's a little bit more detailed with its outward appearance. We have here a little gutter type rain guard. Again, more well beads. Here we have the mount for the ballistic glass, counterweight spring mounts, as well as the main hinge mounts. On the interior section, you can see more little latch mounts found on either end. This is for the pistol port like I mentioned before, but you notice there are a few other little holes here, and that's for the various little mounts and clips that are used to keep the unit in place, which again I'll touch upon once the units enter into production. And here you can see the interior portion of the viewport. Of course, all the weld beads are found in these sections as well. And that now takes us to the main runner, consisting of all of the parts. And what I mean by all the parts, I basically mean all of them. Here you can see the latches, the latch fasteners, the rubber forehead rest, the knob for loosening or pivoting the pistol port, as well as basically every other hinge component that you can think of. Now that you've seen the door components, let's go and take a look at the rear hull here. This little cutout for the rear hatch was added by the original builder of this model. And if we can recall from the first video, the door in the back was a non-functional component. It was just two pieces of sheet styrene that were glued in place and had the external detailing of the rear hatch found in the V100. To the builder's credit, he did an adequate job with sizing out the size of the door, namely the width as well as most of the height. However, the side portions here are cut in a relatively crude manner and need a little bit of polishing up in order to get them to where they need to be. Refining of these pieces here is going to be relatively simple. Just a few passes with a file in the appropriate locations should be enough to square everything off. However, one area that I do need to address in order to mount on my hatches involve this lower portion here of the rear hull. This is more noticeable, specifically when you have the hatches on hand. If I take the hatches and I line them up to their appropriate locations, specifically with the bottom one here, how it needs to wrap around that nice rounded edge section found on the V100 sides. And if I take the top hatch and line it up where it needs to go too, you will quickly see right here that the lower portion of the hull has this nice little gap present. This is something that's gonna to need to be addressed in order to get the hatches to fit in place. By the way, these hatches are to scale and will work on any 1.6 scale V100. This is something that is probably a leftover from when the individual had his static doors in place. From what I see, I guess it's about a half an inch, maybe three quarters of an inch of material that needs to be added to this section over here in order to blend it in and to have the hatch mount on in an appropriate way. This may look like it's something that's a daunting task to undertake, however, it's just basic bodywork, and I'll walk you through the processes on exactly how I prep this component in order to get the material built up and how to get the hatch mounted in place. After a few passes with the file, you can see that I really did a good job with straightening out the cut lines found in these sections over here. The one side effect that this does have, however, is that to remove the material to even it off, this now widened the gap of the hole compared to the way it was before. So much so that if I take the door and put it in its location, you're going to see that there is about a little over an eighth of an inch of gapping that is present on this piece. This here should be within the margins so I'm not too concerned about it however it is something I am going to address and the way I'm going to do this I'm going to build up one of these sections over here with some 
sheet styrene or some styrene bar stock. This should eat up the, rem the remainder of the space, giving me a tighter hole, which should make for a better build. With the vehicle on its side, you can see how the hatch area is starting to take shape. First and foremost, the plastic that has been added really does eat away a large chunk of that open gap that I mentioned before. And at this point here, I am ready to start adding to the sides, but also before I can do that though, I need to take care of the one on the top. To do this, I need to make sure that the clearances are where they need to be. So. I could line up the bottom hatch here. I can't really see it from this camera angle, but basically the hatch is where it needs to be in this type of a format. Now from here, I could go ahead and take the top portion of the hatch and mate it properly to see exactly how much plastic needs to be added. On top of that, I am also going to go ahead and trim this amount of material here from the 3D printed component because like I stated before, it's slightly too long on this pre-production sample that I have here. So for this one, I'm going to go ahead and trim it and then I'll go ahead and make the appropriate adjustments in the CAD software so that the production units, you don't have to go ahead and do this type of setup. So let's go ahead and I'm going to cut across to where I'm going to be adding the plastic layers to the back plate here as well as also the sides. plastic strips added, the door frame is now at its appropriate dimensions. If I take the door here and put it on, you'll see that it fits absolutely perfectly and there's hardly any lateral movement, which is exactly what you're looking for. Before I can go ahead and continue with the bodywork flaring all this in, there is still one more procedure that needs to be done and that involves the corners here of the frame. If you look at the four corners, you'll notice that they come to a 90 degree angle. However, on the hatches themselves, the corners are rounded. This needs to be added to the model at this time before I can progress any further. In order to do this, I went ahead and off screen cut several triangular pieces of eighth of an inch styrene plate that I had on hand. And these are going to be then secured to these four locations. Once the CA is fully set and dry with the aid of a Dremel and with a rounded cutting bit of one flavor or another, I'll be able to add the radius cuts, which will then give me the correct overall shape of the hatch cut. Now that the glues have fully set, I'm ready to go ahead and start adding the radius cuts. For this, I'm gonna be utilizing the high speed removal tool, but not because that's the best tool for the job, it's simply because, well, I'm out of sanding drums in order to fit onto my Dremel. So 
the only bit I have is really this one here, and this is, it really isn't even all that ideal for it due to the smaller size, because my larger size ones are, you guessed it, worn out as well. However, with this tool on hand, I should be able to do the job, but I'm basically going to be doing this procedure really under hard mode, but it's not impossible. To assist with the radius cuts, I went ahead and added the curvature lines to these four sections, and to do this, oddly enough, I used one of my worn out sanding drums here as a template in order to trace around it. This should give me a really good approximation on what the curvature should be, and it should have plenty of clearance with the piece. But I'll know more for certain once the procedure is done, and I'll be able to test for the hatches on. Before I undertake the procedure, one thing I do want to mention is that in order to do this, the number one rule is you need to let the, the adhesives fully dry. They need to be as set as set as can be. Because obviously when you're removing this material here, the plastic is going to be under a lot of force and stress just from the bit cutting away its material. If the pieces are on in a weak manner, like you didn't really use a whole lot of glue to install them, the piece is just going to rip right off and you're going to be back to ground zero. Filming this is actually a few hours after the last scene, so with that in mind, I should hopefully be able to undertake this procedure without losing one or two of them. If you do lose one or two, it's no big deal. It just, you know, basically rinse, wash, and repeat. Try the step again, and, you know, hopefully you'll have better luck the second time around. With the camera off the tripod, you can see in better view the doorway now with the radius cuts. And it's beginning to look more and more like the real vehicle in question. I'll go ahead and test fit the door on to see exactly how it looks like, but let me go ahead and rearrange the camera so you get the, a better look of the door from the inside. With any luck, this should come out on camera, but you can probably see the frame of the hatch and where it makes contact with the doorway on the vehicle. And this is exactly what you're looking for for a model like this. Let's try the top door. It's a bit on the snug side, which is actually good because I could just remove just a little bit amount of material, and it's easier to do as opposed to just adding material like I did before. But we're really close to where we need to be, and it's already a huge improvement to the way it was before. There's still plenty of clearance for the periscope. It does make contact with the upper lip here. Overall, it's looking really good. Well, before I can actually add the body worker here and flare everything in, outside of, of course, doing a little bit of hand fitting for the top door, this portion here is going to be rounded off so it matches the remainder of the body work found on the edges over here. And then I can progress further with the putty work and then sanding everything down. Of course, once all the putty work is done, this piece should be seamless. And then I could start working on the actual installation of the rear hatch. <sighs> all right, that should do the trick. So I went ahead and sanded this section off, removing as much overhang material as possible. And I also went ahead and off camera took care of the hand fitting found on the door frame over here for the clearance of both the bottom as well as more importantly the top hatch. One other thing I want to mention that's actually really important and crucial about this setup is that when you're building a 1-6 scale tank or really any tank model, but this is more true for the larger scale ones, and you're making your tank have or vehicle have functional hatches, you want to pay attention to the clearances from the hatch as well as the vehicle. Specifically if you have the type of hatch like this one here where it actually inserts into the side of the armor plate. Why this is important is because if you know you're building the model and it's a nice snug fit and you feel like well you know that should be good enough, 
it technically isn't because one thing that you fail to factor in is the layers of paint buildup from both the primer as well as the base coat, and in some cases even camouflage that goes on both the exterior as well as even on the interior as well. Remember, this needs to be painted and weathered as well. So with that in mind, if the hatches are a real snug fit in this type of format, when the, everything is all painted and ready for installation, when you open and close the hatch, these areas here are going to rub, and when they rub, you will lose a layer of paint found on these areas that are making the tight contact with the side of the hull. Why this is noteworthy is, well, if you have your model, you're going to have some exposed paint, or I should say exposed material, on these sections, and this can hurt the look of your model. If you're trying to have a model that has fully detailed, you know, hatch interiors and sometimes even full interior, you want to keep this in mind because it's a real easy way to hurt the look. If you have, you know, did all this work on the hatch interior and everything else, only to open up to see bare plastic or resin exposed on some of these areas. So this is something you want to keep in mind of. So when you're working on a model like this, it's okay to have less about like half a millimeter or so of clearance on both on all sides where the hatch will make contact with the vehicle your paint job will appreciate it in the long run so the next step of course is going to be adding the red putty to these areas over here so i can start the bodywork phase where i blend these surfaces into the rear plate making for a nice seamless look before I do that, however, you'll notice I'm going over these areas here with some sandpaper. This is to take care of a few things. First, there is a little bit of residual glue from the addition of these pieces from, you know, the assembly. The glue was added from both to add extra strength, but also it's there from when you attach the pieces, a little bit will ooze out from either end. Of course, that is blended in, but if you don't address this right now, this can lead to extra filing and sanding of the red putty afterwards so it's a good thing just to take care of it beforehand also with some of the way the plates are or these strips are they do slightly emerge from the surface of the plate over here it's not a big deal however it's a good thing to address it at this point here because once the putty goes on it may require two or three more coats of putty in order to flare everything fully as opposed to maybe one or two coats if you go ahead and knock out these high areas at this point in time this here is all done by feel, but hopefully you can see this on camera, but there is a clear line right on the bottom portion here where this plastic strip makes contact with the body. This is where uh, there's a high spot that, like I was mentioning before. So I'm just going to go ahead and possibly hit this with some more sandpaper, even the palm sander, just to remove as much material here as possible. Once I'm happy with the feel of everything, then the red putty can go on, sealing it off. Another way to address high spots is with, well, a razor blade, or in this case, a really bad, dull, rusty, tetanus matic razor blade. This is actually going to be thrown in the trash right after this take. But anyway, the razor blade is another way where you can go ahead and remove high areas where you just basically just put it onto the surface and just scrape along. The razor blade will remove a fine layer of plastic that is found on the high piece here. And after a few passes, it will actually do a pretty good job in leveling things out further. Granted, of course, if you have a fresher blade, it'll work better than this old one here. I'm, honestly, I don't even know why I'm using it. I, just, I guess it was the first one that I found. Just lying around my mess of a shop over here. So, Still, though, more incapable of doing the job at hand. You can see how it just blended these two surfaces away right here. And, and as gnarly as this thing looks, it's actually doing a pretty decent job. That actually did a really good job. Okay, so this thing's gonna head off into the trash can, and then once this is disposed of, I'll be able to go ahead and add the red putty, which will be able to fill in the remainder of these little gaps and holes that are found on these pieces, and then I'll be able to sand everything down to a smooth as silk surface.
Of course, for the Red Potty, I'm using the same material that I use in the other videos, and it's the same tube, which, by the way, is on its that leg right now. So let's go ahead and squeeze as much out as possible, because I think this tube here is done. I do have a fresh tube on hand, but, you know, I just want to go ahead and get my money's worth out of this one. Well, good news is I had just enough putty left in this tube to complete the job, but this job here did finish off this tube. So before I go ahead and send this one to the great beyond, let's go ahead and press F to pay respects for this tube. I got a lot of mileage out of it, and it was able to build a lot of nice models. So with that in mind, this one here can be put out the pasture, and we can go ahead and let this dry where I could then continue with the bodywork job. Once the putty's fully set, it's then time to begin the sanding procedure. This is all going to be done by hand. I'm not going to be utilizing any sort of power tools to do this job, something like a palm sander or an orbital sander or anything like that. This is going to be done with old-fashioned elbow grease. In order to do this, I'm going to start with rougher grit sandpaper and gradually move my way to the finer gauge stuff as the surface becomes smoother and smoother. To start with, I have 100 grit sandpaper over here, and by the end, I should have the 320 grit right here for the job. In the past, some questions that I have been getting in several of my emails, as well as also in my videos, is exactly how do you do the body work? Well, obviously I just showed the putty, but when it comes time for sanding it down, a lot of individuals out there who don't really have a lot of experience with working with, you know, putties or doing a little bit of body work, they tend to put the putty on and they sand it off, but then when the model's fully painted, you can see where the putty was remaining, and they really didn't polish it off further enough. On this build here, you can see how I've been just going over the surface, and this is just with the 100 grit sandpaper, and it's been doing a really good job so far with leveling it off. One thing I do want to mention is that when you're sanding something down, you don't want to put too much force on the sandpaper. You really just want to have the sandpaper just sitting on the surface here, and just basically with the motion of your hand, that's what's doing the job with sanding down the surface. If you put too much pressure on, basically you're going to be over sanding in some locations where the sandpaper will actually start bending into the cavities that you're trying to fill up and then you're still going to have pools available that you're going to have to then go over with more coats. Or what can also happen is that if you put too much pressure on, you'll actually start sanding down the material on the body itself. So you'll have this perpetual type thing going where no matter how much you sand, you'll actually be able to see this little valley, I guess, or this incline of where the bodywork was done. So, like, basically, again, if you're watching or paying attention, I'm just keeping the sandpaper just on the surface here, and I'm just going up and down. Sometimes I go in a circular motion, and just it's all basically in the wrist. Notice my wrist is nice and loose, and I'm just moving my hand, or I should say moving my arm, and it's just swaying in that type of motion. That's really the best way to do it. This is the same technique, by the way, that I'll also be utilizing with the finer grit sandpaper as the polishing comes to its end.
For the final coat, you'll notice that I'm going in a really slow, methodical manner. This is so you don't over sand at this point here. And again, it just gives you more control over the sanding process. You also can't see it right now, but after I make a few passes, I'm looking at the sheen or the reflection through the light fixture, which is over to the, I guess, over to the right over there. And by doing that, I could actually see the surface to see if there's any imperfections like divots or angles or anything else along those lines. It also, it's a good way to detect if there are any high spots, which like I stated before, is one way where it really gives away your model and it's one thing that can hurt the look. And unlike a tank's surface or an armor plate where in some cases it's, it has cast texturing on it, for the V100 here, that's not the case. These things were very, very smooth. So you have to take that into consideration. Okay, so that takes care of the bodywork now. There are two things I need to take care of. First are the little small overlaps of putty that are on the rim over here. Obviously these need to go just for the hatch to properly fit in place. But also I know it's a small, very fine little crack. It's kind of, not a crack, it's more or less like a miniature fault line. And it kind of runs on this portion here and goes down. This is probably more than likely from with the way the putty set and dried. It was a little bit thicker in these areas over here, and when something dries like that, it will eventually cause fissures with the way the things dry and they shrink. So this is normal, and it's very easily taken care of. I'm just going to take a small little swipe of red putty, smear it on this section over here, which should do a good job in filling in these small little fissures. Once the putty's fully set, I can then go over and polish that extra material away, blending into the remainder of the bodywork. For this procedure here, I don't need to go with the other thicknesses, or I should say the coarser grain sandpapers that I was using before, because it's going to be such a fine, thin layer here, it's just not necessary for that use. With the model now rotated right side up, one thing that I noticed that I need to do before I can start with the hatch mounting procedure involves the leading edge that we have here on the top portion. Just like I mentioned in one of the previous update videos for this project, on the side leading edges here of the V100, there's a slight overhang. This was added on this model with a thin little strip of Plastruck strip. The leading edges are found on all four corners, but are also present on the top portions as well. On the rear plate here, it would go from this point to this point, and then there's another smaller section that's directly next to the exhaust duct that we have right here. While on the topic of the leading edge, the broken section that I mentioned before has been fully repaired at this time. With the rear hatch components going through their paint and weathering procedures, let's go ahead and switch back to the front steering mechanisms that I touched upon earlier. Here you can see all the exact same components, but now they have been fully painted and weathered, and at this point here, they're ready for installation. The parts are painted and weathered with the exact same painting and weathering techniques that were showcased in an earlier update video. The one part, however, where this is different with is, of course, the hydraulic ram. The ram, you'll notice, is painted differently compared to the standard dark olive drab, which is found on the other components. The reason why I went with this format was to give a little bit more character and a little bit more spice to the model, and also I was really heavily influenced by the real V100 that I saw in person at the military vehicle show. 
the component on that vehicle basically had this type of format, although it was much more cleaner compared to the weathered state that you'll see on this unit over here. For this one, the center canister here is painted in black, and the end portions are painted to replicate aluminum or steel. Have a few areas where we have some fluid seepage, which of course is what you would see sometimes on these hydraulic ramps, specifically after they get used quite a bit. And I've, I did the standard aging techniques that I've used on, again, many of the other builds that are found on this channel. From the hydraulic ram, this now takes us to the hydraulic fittings. The fittings themselves, have, of course, have been fully painted and weathered at this point. For this model here, you notice that the fittings are replicating brass fittings, which was the case on several of the real V100s that I was studying. For the actual tube itself, I'm not sure if I covered this earlier, but in case I didn't, I'm going to be utilizing this thin little section here of TPU filament. This filament here is what's used on 3D printers, but this one here is the flexible type, which is really nice because it has some nice bends to it, and it'll really do a good job in, gi in giving you the appearance of the rubber hydraulic lines, which of course are used on vehicles like this. Next, of course, is the Yolk. Here you can see how the unit looks like when it's all painted and weathered. And of course, this detailing here is going to be the last bit of the puzzle in order to seal the detailing found on the inner wheel well area. So, without any further, let's go ahead and get these components mounted to the vehicle. Alright, so here we have the power steering system now fully completed. Unfortunately, I didn't get on camera the installation of the of the hydraulic ram before the shield went on. However, you can see some photographs that I took prior to the installation of the shield where you see all the hydraulic fluid lines all connected into their appropriate locations. With the last of the detailing added, you can also see that the component is fully functional. From here, I could just mount on the row wheel and flip the model up so that's right side up. And honestly, I don't think I have to flip the model over ever again. From henceforth, the model is just gonna be built in its right side up configuration. Just like I mentioned before, by the way, this was the last remaining bit of detailing required to finish off the suspension aspect of this model. So with this out of the way, this is one chapter completely closed on this build. Here are the doors now going through their installation process. You'll notice that they have been primed with the coat of olive drab spray paint. This is done to act as a primer, but it also is a good base for my interior hatch colors. So I'm just gonna weather on top of that on the inside portion. But other than that, the installation went as follows. I basically drilled the two holes on the top and the bottom where the pegs are going to lock into. But one little bit of detailing I need to do before I can actually physically mount the hatches in place is you'll notice that I took a Sharpie and I went ahead and traced the outline of the hatch. You see, just like with the side portions here of the hull, the hatch recess has a small little lip that runs around it. The lip is gonna be fabricated with the same materials and techniques that I used to fabricate the other recesses that I mentioned before. It's absolutely paramount that I secure these strips at this time here because once the hatches get fitted on, where the overlap is, you're not really going to be able to easily paint and weather these locations. So this will actually run the risk of having exposed plastic areas even when the model is fully completed, which is something that can hurt the look and it's something I really want to avoid. So to avoid that, I'm going to go ahead and fabricate the strips at this point so then I could thoroughly paint, weather everything, and then once everything is all set, I can then permanently mount on the rear hatch. The Sharpie line here gives me a fantastic guide in order to add the strips to the appropriate locations. And then once everything is all set, the hatch should be a perfect fit onto these locations here. Fabricating the strip on this section here is going to be a little bit more complicated compared to the other units that I mentioned in the earlier video. On this type of section here, you're going to have a few compound curves to contend with. And what I mean by that is you have the first curve, which will be going over this center portion that we have here on the hull. But in addition to that, you also have the curves that have to wrap around the frame section of the actual doorway, which, as you notice, is going to be a nice little constant curve themselves. And this one has to be repeated four times, unlike this one here, which is really one or two. So with that out of the way, let me go ahead and see if I could cobble this together.
with the paint that was added to the rear section is in drying time, I was then able to concentrate on the remainder of the interior weathering work found on the rear hatch. Here you can see what the components look like now that they're fully completed. On the top portion over here, that would include the visor, the pistol port, the pistol port knob, as well as the locking levers. The locking levers are fully functional and I believe are actually going to be really useful on the bottom one in order to secure the hatch in the closed position, but I'll touch upon that later when the unit is mounted to the vehicle. For the weathering, I use my typical technique with various washing, counter shading, as well as some dry brushing. The main weathering is all accomplished with the airbrush. On the headrest here, note that the piece is rubber on the real unit. Obviously, you don't want to slam your forehead onto the sharp metal edges. So they have this rubber pad that gets fastened in place, and it's actually adjustable via these four fasteners that we have here. While on the topic of the periscopes, one thing I do want to mention is that you notice that I already have all the CAD files completed for these pieces here. These are going to be recycled for both these side hatches, but also I'm going to have a slightly different version that's going to be used for the side armor plate periscope detailing. However, more on this information, of course, is to come. All that needs to be added now are the external fittings which would include the ballistic glass, as well as the ballistic glass clips, and that will wrap up the external periscope detailing. However, these are going to be added after the model is fully painted and completed, and it's really one of the last things that are added to this vehicle. Once the unit is secured in place, however, I need to address the assist springs that we have on these sections here, but I'll touch upon that as the video progresses. Setting this aside, takes us to the lower panel. There's really nothing much to talk about over here with the exception of the giant spring. This spring here is just for looks. It's basically just some electrical wire that has been spooled up in order to give you the spring detailing. This will be supplied with the ECA set. Of course, once the paint dries, the hatches are then mounted in their appropriate locations. One thing I wanna point out about the hatch design is that on this vehicle here, this is the second pattern of rear hatch design for the Commando. When the V100 was first designed, the hatch was completely different compared to the configuration you see it here. It was actually one continuous plate that was spring assisted and the entire unit just opened up in that type of a format. This was found on some very early examples of the V100. However, when the vehicles were deployed to Southeast Asia, the small stature of the Arvin troopers lent to have some problems with this design because when the hatch would be open it was deemed to be too difficult for these individuals to properly open and close the hatch. So with that input in mind the designers at Cadillac Gage redesigned the system to the dual configuration that we see here. With the brief history lesson out of the way, let's go ahead and look at the rear hatch now in more depth. What's cool about the V100 redesigned rear hatch is that it utilizes a dual hinge type system. The first hinge is a simple hinge and just attaches the rear hatch to the rear plate of the vehicle. However, the second hinge is a floating type system and that consists of this entire apparatus that we have here. The ECA system is fully functional and works much along the same ways as the real unit. By the way, the little latches that are found on the model actually do hold the hatches in their closed state. So one thing that I had to do prior to filming of this take was I went ahead and loosened the levers both on the inside just to prevent any sort of mishaps when it comes time to open up the hatch. With the way the system opens, you'll see how the hinge system actuates and it's actually really interesting once you actually play with it. And there you go. You can see how everything just flows in one continuous motion. One thing that I also noticed as a side note was that for the materials that I use to make the springs, like I may have mentioned before, it's made from coiled electrical wire and solid core wire. And although it's not spring steel or anything, it does have some slight sp springy nature to it. And when I was bending everything into shape, I actually have to be careful of the orientation of the spring because it actually was preventing me from closing the hatch and with the way it is now it actually helps it open up so it's kind of weird how that actually panned out anyway if I open up the hatch you'll notice that it stays in the open state that's also a really nice feature that it has and it has even a half open 
capability to it too. Again, it's very reminiscent of the real vehicle and it's one of those really cool things of scratch building that when you pull everything off and it works in the similar nature as the real one, it does feel very re rewarding. One thing I do want to point out at this moment here, you'll see that the integrally printed on Wellbeat slightly overhangs into this large cavity that we have here for the rear top hatch. This is something I'm going to address as the build progresses. Chances are really good that this hatch hole here is slightly too large, so I'm going to have to readjust it much along similar lines as what I mentioned before earlier in this video, but that's something to be discussed in an upcoming video. However, you can see again how everything is fully functional, and you can actually see how the pieces are all designed to work. With this center lug over here. This is the unit that holds the springs in place and we have this little pin that on the real vehicle is held in place and is what the wires actually rest upon in order to give the spring tension. On the real unit I believe this is even adjustable with small little holes in it. Probably going to add those with a Dremel in a little bit but you can see exactly how the unit basically is all encompassing right here. One thing I also want to mention is that you'll notice that the glass or I should say the prism has not yet been fitted to this vehicle. This is going to be added after the vehicle is painted, but you'll see it has the eighth of an inch recess ready to go for the Lexan that I'm going to be using for this application, but more on that is to follow. While installing the rear hatch, you can see the bottom hatch has been mounted at this time, and it is so far a perfect installation. One thing I want to mention is with the spring that we have here. On the real vehicle, this spring is used to make the door easier to pull up when it comes time to close it up. And you'll notice that on the V100 hinge, there are these two holes found on the hinges. The purpose of these holes are for the spring to lock in, and then the other portion of the spring would then just sit right here on the vehicle. What's interesting to point out is that even though both of the hinges have their holes in it, on all the V100s I've seen, the hinge spring is usually in this one that we have over here. This one here needs to line up against the side of the hull. However, if I just glue it onto the side over here, it can possibly cause some issues, specifically when it comes time for opening and closing the hatch, and it'll eventually just pop off and look really bad. So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to go ahead and give the illusion that the spring is resting on the side, but it's actually permanently attached to the vehicle. The way I'm going to do this involves this pin vise that I have here. What I went ahead and did was I marked with a pencil a small spot right here below the hinge work. I'm going to drill a hole in here and basically all I'm going to do is I'm going to take this wire, bend it at 90 degrees, glue it inside. On the outward appearance it's going to look like the spring is just permanently resting right here on this side of the hull, but in actuality it's plugged into it. It's a real simple procedure to do, but once added it's a nice easy way to give your model a little bit of extra detailing. Now this is something that's really niche and it's basically V100 specific, but in case you are scratch building or working on a vehicle and you come across something similar to this, this is one technique that you can use on your build in order to get the same, the same desired look. So as we just saw before, the top portion of the hatch is fully functional, but so is the bottom. Just like I mentioned before, the latches that are found on the detail piece are fully functional and do as what they are intended to do. They are keeping the hatch in its place right now and preventing it from flopping down. So if I just loosen those, it just opens up as it would on the real vehicle. As you can see, the piece is fully hinged and swings nice and freely. One bit of detailing that I still need to add is going to be a hatch stop, which is found in this location over here. Basically, this just prevents the hatch from over swinging and gives it a nice place for it to rest. This will be discussed in the next video. With the hatch closed, let me just go ahead and put the locks back in place. There we go. You can see how the spring has been modeled in this position over here. After the doors are on, the next thing I turned my attention to was the installation here of the tool rack. This tool rack here is a new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com product line. It is all 3D printed. Unfortunately, I didn't get any shots of this unit before I added the coat of primer that you see on it, but with these images that are flashed on screen, you get a good idea on what the piece looks like fresh from the printer. 
This unit here is all encompassing. It is a single 3D print, so there are no other little bits of detailing to glue onto it at this point in order to get it to this condition that you see it here. Along with this rack here, I also have in development a set of the Pioneer tools, which will be designed to fit onto these locations that are found on this tool rack. And of course, this will be added to the ECA catalog once ready. To install the rack, on the real vehicle, there would be four fasteners found on these locations here that are used to secure this piece to the vehicle. On the ECA set, the fasteners are integrally printed onto the frame. There are stems that emerge from the bottom portion, and basically all you need to do for installation is to mark and drill out the four corresponding locations, and then the unit just plugs directly onto your vehicle. This then is just glued in place, and then that should be enough to keep the piece firmly at bay. One other thing I want to mention is with the standoff that the rack has with the side of the hull. If you notice, the unit is not flushly mounted to the vehicle. This is as per the real unit. On the real unit, there would be a standoff which would be accomplished by a set of washers that are found on each of these fasteners. These washers are integrally printed onto the rack, so it's one less detail that you need to worry about as the builder. Because the washers are integrally printed on, once you secure the, the piece to the vehicle, you are going to have the proper standoff that is required. Also, with the camera close in, you can also see more of the finer details found on these pieces. With the way the rack is designed on the real unit, it's just basically comprised of four pieces of angle iron, which are then arranged to the format that you see here to form the shape of the box. All of these fine details are built into the CAD file and are found on the printing that you see in front of you. In addition to what I said before about the tools, you'll also see the little straps that we have here. These straps are printed hollow and are designed for, well, real straps to be used in order to secure all the tools in their appropriate locations. But more information on that, of course, is to follow as the build goes on. One other thing I want to mention about this tool rack is that this is not exclusively found on the V100 armored car. This pattern of tool rack and, and similar patterns of tool racks that look basically identical to this were used on U.S. military vehicles dating back all the way to the early portion of World War II. They've been seen on the Deuce and a Half trucks, the Dodge Command cars, and for the heavier armor, the M46 Patton, M47 Patton, M48 Patton, V100, and so on and so forth. So this rack here is a very prolific bit of detailing found on a large number of US military vehicles. As you can see, the rear plate's really fleshing out nicely. There are a few more details that need to be added, namely the taillights, the jerry can, the bump stop, as well as the tow hitch, but these will be discussed and added in the next video update. And with that, that wraps up this project update video for this 1-6 scale Cadillac Gauge V100 XM706 armored car. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being 1-6 scale project update videos like this guy over here or the other smaller scale model showcase videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build that have been posted since the project start, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that are also frequently showcased on this channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Till the next one. Catch you guys later.